So let's try to finish this journey towards atomic multi-reader, multi-writer. And again, I try to insist that the point is not necessarily in the result, it's in the journey, it's, it's in the techniques you see. So now let's, let's try to go one step further. So we have gone all the way from safe, single reader, uh, towards uh, regular multi-reader, multi-valued register. So now let's try to go into the other direction of atomic, just to understand again this notion of linearizability of atomicity. So assume you are given a single reader, single writer, regular register, and you want to make it atomic. Still single reader, single writer. And I ask you, come up with the algorithm. Try to think about it a little bit. Again, two or three minutes. We have one reader, one writer, not the same. We have a regular register and we want to go to linearizable. Yes? You can assume it multivalued. And uh, as always, the diff really the fundamental thing, the fundamental question you have to ask yourself is, what is the difference? Remember, the difference is if there is a concurrent read, the regular, the one you have, can return the new value and then the old value. If you have atomic, this is forbidden. So your algorithm should forbid this. But you have a single reader, single writer. So what should you do? You have to prevent the situation where the reader returns the new value and then the old value. Any clue? One reader, one writer. Yes? You add some version number. Okay, so why do you want to version number? Right. Exactly. So here, if you think about it, the problem happens because a reader, there is only one, returns the new value, and then later on, returns the old value. What we can do is simply ask the reader, if you see a new value, then later on, don't return an older value. Return the new one, because you have already returned it. But in order to be able to express that fact, we need to represent the notion of new and old. How do you do new and old? How do we represent that in com concurrent distributed computing? What do you do? They had, it has a name. Timestamp. The magic name is timestamp. Notice that timestamp only appeared here. We didn't talk about timestamps before. It's just when we start talking about atomicity that timestamps kick in. A timestamp is simply a way of representing what is new, what is old, of representing time. And this is what we want here. So now the game changed a little bit because we want the writers to be able to say, this is version number one, this is version number two, this is version number three, etc. So the writer uses a timestamp. So this actually has to be multi-valued because now, whenever you write a value, you write with it a timestamp. So you have to view the writing as a couple. So what should the reader do? Now you have seen the writer. What should the reader do? And it's Exactly. Remember the old version. If you see something old, forget it. So the idea is whenever you read, now you know that you're going to read a pair. Timestamp value. And then you say, if the value I'm reading now has a bigger timestamp than the previous value I read, I have a variable t, then I update my timestamp, I return the new value. Otherwise, I ignore. Okay, so we are, what we are doing here is just like we did earlier. Remember earlier, what we did is we asked the writer, don't write if it's the same value. Here we are telling the reader, don't return if the value you have seen is an old value. If you see something older, ignore it. It's clear? Very simple. And again, these ideas, you see them over and over in all kinds of data structure. Yes? 
yeah, this, this transformation doesn't work with binary because we assume that we have timestamps. And timestamps actually mean a lot. They mean not only multivalued, but in theory. This means you can write an infinite number of integers. Timestamps means it keeps increasing. Okay? So I'm here. That's why I said what I'm presenting is going to be a little bit simplistic. I'm making an assumption here that you can keep writing bigger and bigger values. Okay? In theory, this means I have infinite memory here. Just under bracket. There have been algorithms to recycle timestamps. But these algorithms are very complicated. If you got interested into timestamps, you have to read the PhD thesis of, anybody knows who did his PhD about recycling timestamps? Eretz, you should know. Who did that? PhD about recycling timestamps. Very famous person. You know, Petr? Nir Shavit. So his PhD, so five years recycling timestamps. It's actually a very good PhD. Just to tell you that all these simple, they look simple. But if you have to think about them, recycling timestamps, this is big stuff, five years. And the story is not over. There are still a lot of problems there. Okay, so we know how to go to single reader, single writer. This algorithm works because we have one reader. The reader checks, oh, this is old, I ignore. Now, if we go to multi-reader, single writer, atomic, this algorithm, I guess you can easily see that it's not going to work. Anybody has a clue why? If I just put this algorithm in the concurrent, in the multi-readers, it's not going to work. Why? Exactly. So if I take this very same algorithm and I run it with two readers, only two, it could be that one reader comes and returns a, a, a new value, and then another reader comes and returns an older value. Because his timestamp, he, he missed the timestamp of this reader. You see what I'm saying? Okay, it's, it's clear. This doesn't work for multi-readers. Okay, good. Do you understand why it doesn't work? Who does not see why it doesn't work? Everybody. Okay. If you understand why it doesn't work, just two readers. You should be able to come up with the algorithm for multiple readers. If you really understand why it doesn't work for two readers. Why it doesn't work? Because there could be... It's okay. Let's imagine the following scenario. I'm giving you this class. I have timestamps. The timestamps have numbers. This is time... The, the, sorry. I'm, I'm giving you slides. The slides have timestamps. But you are staying home. Each one of you is home. Distributed, computing. But you are looking at my slides from home. And what we want to avoid is the situation where uh, Petr sees, the first reader, sees slides number 16. And Eretz later sees slides number 15. This we want to avoid. This is bad. How do we avoid this? I want them to not have this situation. If there is Petr alone, Petr checks. I read 16, oh, now 15, I ignore. I have to go to 17, or I simply stick with 16. If there are two readers, how do we do that? Again, a fundamental trick or pattern in concurrent computing. How do we do that? I have two readers. I want to prevent them from returning an old, a new value, and then an old value. What do I do? Raise your hand so that I see who you are. Yes? I tell them not to, but uh, don't always obey. Okay, the, the readers should check. So I tell the two readers, you have to check. But how do they check? How can they? Yes? Speak higher. So the way to make them check, the only way they can communicate is by reading and writing. That's the only way. So how can they check? Yeah, so the idea, and this looks even weird. The idea is to say, whenever 
roughly speaking. Whenever somebody reads a value, Petr reads slide 16, he tells all the other readers, if there is only one, he tells the other reader, I have reached number 16. The reader starts writing. He has to inform the others, I have reached slide 16. In fact, he does not finish his read until he has written Slide 16 to all the other readers. Okay? What we are saying here is that to implement an atomic register with multiple readers, we are using a very big weapon. We are asking the, right, the readers to start writing. And this is usually very, very inefficient. But this is actually the price to pay. There is an interesting theorem. I'm not going to prove it here, but it's not that difficult to prove that whenever you want to implement a multi-reader atomic register with weaker registers, the reader has to write. This theorem has been proven in different contexts. Lamport has proved it a long time ago. There have been different proofs, one of them by Edith Kedar and Rui Fan. There have been other proofs of this same idea, but the idea is fundamental. Okay, so the algorithm is the following. Once you understand the idea that the reader has to write, the rest, okay, is implementation details. So we are using a lot of registers. Why? Because the only thing we have are single, sing, single reader, single writer atomic. If we want the readers to write, they have each of them to use one register to write to any one of the other registers. And this is n square because every reader is doing that. In addition to these n square registers, we also need the registers where the writer will write. So we have n square for the readers to communicate, plus n for the writer, for me, to tell you this is first slide, second slide, third slide, etc. So as a writer, what I do is the same as before. I give you my slides. I give them to each one of you. For j equals 1 to n, the number of readers, I tell you this is my slide, this is my slide, this is my slide, okay? For the writer, it's stays almost the same. For the reader, it's more complicated because now they have to communicate. The way they do it is the following. So this is just explaining what I said. Every reader, so now Petr, before reading, he does not only look at what I'm supposed to write to him. He has also to check what other readers could have told him. If he relies only on me, he's in danger because maybe he will see something older than another reader has already returned. Are we together? So he checks all the registers, the one where I write and the one where other readers could have written. Are we together? Which one does he select? Which slide does he select? The one with the highest timestamp, the new one, because the new one has been returned by someone and he doesn't want to return an older. He reads all registers. So he goes from J to N, he reads all the registers of other readers, plus the one of the writer. He selects the one with the highest timestamp. So this operation means selects the, reg the, the register, the, the slide in my parlance with the highest timestamp. And before returning it, what should he do? Write it. Okay? He reads everywhere, selects the register with the highest timestamp and write it. You see the algorithm? If we have only two readers, this means every reader checks if the other reader has returned something with a new timestamp, get it, and if we have more than two, then this reader has to also write it to the other one. Okay? Is it clear? It looks complicated and it is, unfortunately. We cannot do much better. Whenever you want to do atomic, you have the reader to write. Otherwise, you have to give up atomicity. But you understand why. Because they, there is no choice. The reader has to write. If you want linearizability with multiple readers, then it, you have to pay the price. Questions? Yes? Yes. And the reader has to write, and has to write a lot. Yeah, so it's, any, yes? 
speak higher? Why don't you what? Because if you do that, if, you, if a reader goes, assume the reader takes the, the, the register that is the highest. These registers are regular, right? So Petr goes and finds this register which has slide number 22, very new slide, right? And then there is another reader that comes after him. He goes to the same register, which gave him, gave Petr slide number 22, but this register is regular. It could give somebody else slide 20, because the writer didn't finish yet. See what I'm saying? I am the writer. I didn't finish. So the read of Petr and your read, who comes after the read of Petr, are both concurrent with my write. So I cannot do that. So again, what I'm saying is that this apparent simple difference between regular and atomic has huge consequences. It's a big difference in the complexity. It's a big difference. You have to pay a big price. So you have to ask yourself when you build an application, do I need this linearizability? Maybe it's fine if sometimes uh, the reader returns a new value and then an old value. Maybe it's okay. But you can ask yourself this question and answer knowing exactly the difference in price. There was a question here somewhere? Yeah, the, 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 the goal is to build atomic. Okay, I, I see what, you, yeah, but, but to get to that atomic, we, we can go back to that later. I, I know what you mean. We can go back later. Let me go back later. I see what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. Can you what? Uh, it's not easy for this algorithm. Proving this algorithm correct is not trivial. Yeah, finding the linearization point is not trivial. But what, what, what you said actually is close to this. Finding the linearization point. Let's keep that aside for now and we can talk on it. Okay. We are almost there. We almost finished the journey. And I took some shortcuts. But we almost finished the journey. Now, the algorithm I just presented, where the readers, they go, they write, I said, has one single item. And the goal of the writer, increase timestamps, write it. If I use this algorithm and now deploy it with multiple writers, is it going to work? Now, assume you have several professors putting their slides. Is this algorithm going to work? Is it going to produce an atomic? If, of course not, otherwise I would have written a multi-reader, multi-writer directly. So it doesn't work. But why? Anybody knows why? So I take this algorithm and I use it for multiple writers. So yeah, exactly. So the problem is here, I own my timestamps. And I, I reach timestamp 16. Now assume I'm giving this class concurrently with Nir. Nir is also giving the class. You are staying home and you are following both classes. And in order to build the abstraction of an atomic register, you have to guarantee that if Nir writes something after I do, his value is the latest. That's what you should return. But maybe I reach slide 16, but Nir is very slow. He's after me in time, but his timestamp is only three. He gives you slide three after I give you slide 16. You apply this algorithm, you say, oh, I ignore near slide number three because it doesn't look older than my slide. You see what I'm saying? So the problem is the writers define the timestamps. And of course, not only they disagree, but they can make even worse. They can convey false information. So if I have multiple writers, I need to find a way to make them somehow synchronize their timestamps. So what can I do? Ask them to read first. Raise your hand. Who said that? What should they read? Exactly. So the idea is what I just did for the readers, I need to do it for the writers. What does that mean? That means if I and Nir Shavit are given the class, 
whenever I want to give you a new slide, I should go to Nir's slides and read, oh, he used timestamp 3, then I'm fine with 16. He also has to come and say, oh, Rashid used timestamp 16, then I should use at least 17. You see what I'm saying? So we need to read each other's timestamps, which means we need more registers, just for the sake of making sure our timestamps are coordinated, so to speak. Okay, so the last step, is to use timestamps where whenever I want to write a new slide, I go and read in specific, the, the registers now that I'm using here, their sole purpose in life is to tell me what timestamps, what is the latest, that's what they do. I go and check, I increment, I write, okay? Now, when the reader wants to read, it gets the value with the highest timestamp. Now, there is something here that you should be careful about. The algorithm simply says, go see what timestamp NIR has used, increment. It could happen that two processes write with the same timestamp. Right? We are three. We are not only two, we are three. There is more Elihi, NIR, and myself. We go, we check NIR. NIR has timestamp three. I increment, I have four. Maurice has timestamp four. What should the reader take if we have the same timestamp? How do you do that? Any clue? Raise your hand. You use process ID. So the usual trick is you use some, uh, uh, some uh, breaking ties deterministic scheme like process IDs. Okay? So you say, okay, if, if they have the same timestamp, I use the one which letter in the alphabet is, 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 is first. So G comes before H of Herlihy, therefore, I assume that the timestamp of Rashid is older than the timestamp of Morris. Period. Okay? All these tricks I'm talking about, synchronize on the timestamp, readers have to write, uh, check if the value is old, otherwise not write it, etc. You see them over and over in concurrent and distributed computing. Okay? So what I said here is starting from very, very simple registers, we ended up in the strongest ones. True, all kinds of tricks. Always wait free. Okay? The goal is to be atomic, but always preserve weight freedom. Good. Okay, I will go quickly here. So now, you are an engineer. You said, okay, so these guys, this guy told us that Lamport has shown some time ago, together with others, that if the hardware gives me very, very simple registers, I can build in software the abstraction of very strong registers. And the programmer will not see the difference. The programmer will see the, the th things as if the hardware was given atomic multi-reader, multi-writer registers. Okay, so far so good. Now you say, well, but applications do not only need registers. If I want to work for Facebook, I should show them how to build a counter. We didn't build a counter yet, remember? We just said if I use locks, it's not going to work very well. If I don't want to use lock, what should I do? And now I have registers. I'm able to use atomic registers. Okay? How can I build a counter with atomic registers? Now if I think a little bit, I say, okay, let's try I have only been showing you how to go from one register to another register. Now let's build something presumably more sophisticated, a counter. Assume what I want to build is this counter. I think of the following. This counter has two operations, read and increment. Read returns the value of the counter. Increment adds one to the counter. Assume I want to build this. For now, forget about the prime number, the Facebook exercise. Think about this. How can I implement this object? Now, when I say implement, I mean weight free, atomic. I want to implement a counter that is atomic and in a weight free manner using registers. Any idea? This counter.
Very, very simple. Anyone here? <clears throat> These guys are winning, so. Yes? Okay, each one writes in its own. Exactly. So there is, this is also a very uh, classical trick. You do the following. We use, uh, no, this doesn't work, sorry. The processes, they use an array of registers. If we are N processes, we use N registers. We have only registers. Now what I want to implement is not big read, big write operation. I want to implement the increment and read operation of the counter. When I increment, what I do is I am process I, I go to the register I, and I increment my register. I call it my register because I am the only writer in that register. Okay? So far so good? When I read, what, what do I do? The reader goes and sums the counters. Very easy. So if there are two processes, each of them wants to increment. He increments his registers. Uh, I increment my register. The reader comes, sums. It's pretty obvious that the reader will always see the sum. Will, will always see the latest value. He's and an I do what I do. Is it clear? So I implement my counter like this. Any question on this implementation? Okay, now let me go back to the counter I just implemented. This one. Can I use this in the test of Facebook? Remember, Facebook asked me to implement this uh, chasing prime numbers and using a counter. Well, using a counter is an idea I came up with to make sure that every machine has a new integer to check whether it's prime or not. I use this guy. Yes? It doesn't guarantee what? It doesn't guarantee you need, give me a concrete example. I have two machines, what could happen? So what could happen is, is what? Uh, yeah, so what could happen, for example, is that, in fact, all the machines could keep checking the same value, the primary, primary of the same value. For example, they come, we have reached number 200, all machines come, they read, they find 200. They say, oh, I need to check now for 201. They, all of them do this. Increment 201, put back 201. So this counter doesn't do the job. It's a counter, but it's not really good enough for what I want. Why? Why is it so? Why is this behavior, weird behavior? What's the reason? Higher. Yeah, the, the race condition is somewhere there, but what's the problem? What should I do to avoid this situation? Exactly. The problem here, and this is, this is also very important. Here, the counter I, 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 I devised is too weak. Why is it weak? Because it has two operations, read and increment, that are separate. This makes it weaker. What I want is one operation that does both. Whenever I use this operation, it increments and gives me the new value, which this counter doesn't do. Okay, so here, what I'm saying is that the specification of the object is crucial. You can believe that you have specified a good object, you are happy, you implement it, you prove it, but that's not what you need. What I need is much stronger. Okay, what I'm saying here is the following. If you have registers, you can implement a lot of objects. I just gave you one, a weak counter. You can actually implement many objects with registers. You can implement snapshots, you can implement kind of objects. But if I want to implement 
this counter that puts the read and, and increment together, increments and gives me the new value, then I need to think more carefully. So now, try to think more carefully. How do I, how can you implement with registers a counter that puts the read and the write together? Sorry, here it is. So, any idea? Now, I want to mix the read and increment together. And I want them to increment and return to me the value. And everything should be atomic. If you come with the solution in two minutes, you have a beer. So an algorithm that uses the atomic registers to build the counter with the read and ink together. Yeah, not the first. Any idea? Okay. So whomever comes with this algorithm, two beers. And raise your hand. Why would you why what makes you think so? Yes? How many what? Oh, how many concurrent threads? Two. Just take, give me a solution with two. And you get three beers. Okay, so you know this. So it's impossible. Uh, exactly as you said. So here again, notice the game. This, this counter looks okay, we can do it, then you can do many things, but there is something that looks almost as easy, a priori, it's just impossible. And I'm going to prove to you that it's impossible. Okay? That this counter I was looking for is impossible. It's impossible, what does that mean? Given the, all the assumptions I had, it's asynchronous, it's this, it's that, blah, 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 plus I have only atomic registers, then this counter that has the read and increment together is impossible. And this is a part called the limitation of registers. Why is it called the limitation of registers? To, to convey the fact that if you have even the strongest form of atomic registers, which is, by the way, equivalent to the weakest form because you can build one on top of the other, you cannot do everything. You can do certain things. I just give you one example, what I call the weak counter. You can do many, but there are certain things you cannot. And now we're going to go slowly to see why. You cannot. Probably you have heard this, but we'll repeat it again. Okay. So we have a world with registers. And we want something more. We want uh, snapshots, we want counters, we want queues, we want whatever. But the game is, is, the question really is, okay, counters, but what kind of counters exactly? There is one kind we can do, and this kind, where the read and the ink together, we cannot. This kind of counter I'm talking about is called fetch an increment. To distinguish it from other counters, this one is called fetch an increment. And we want to emphasize the fact that these two operations are mixed. The ink and the fetch are together. This is what we want to emphasize. Still, the counter contains an integer, and the operation fetch an increment increments the counter and returns the new value. Okay, this is what we want. Okay, so the way to do it and the way that has been done is very, very smart. 
I mean, what has been done is to prove that it's impossible. Uh, I don't remember the year. I think it's, it's more is to have shown that this is impossible, right? Yeah. So you, you, you're going to see Maurice Hurley on Thursday? Tomorrow. Okay. So in 90, maybe 90 or something, 91, people were trying to implement these counters with registers. A lot of people. And they thought it was possible. Many people thought it was possible, and they were even coming up with algorithms. And the problem with algorithms in concurrent and distributed computing is that most of the time they work. So you run them, they work. They increment, they do everything right. And sometimes they work. Whenever you run them, they work. But does that doesn't mean that they, they will work all the time. Why? Because you just manage by the game of concurrency to always end up in the good situations. As long as you don't get up in the bad situation, it, doesn't, it works. Building a concurrent or distributed algorithm means it has to work all the time. So before 90, people were implementing fetch and increment and other objects and were believing that it works. But sometimes they say, okay, can we prove it works so it doesn't seem blah, 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 blah. And then Maurice came, Maurice Hurley came with a great idea. He said, maybe it's impossible. It looks weird. If you have done computer science, classical computer science, once you have a Turing machine, everything is possible. Right? This is the famous thesis. Everything that is computable is computable on the Turing machine. So this notion of something is impossible is weird. Of course, you know that something, some specific problems are impossible, like halting or whatever, but this doesn't look like halting. It doesn't have any recursive nature. It's not that kind. So why should it be impossible? Of course, certain things are, have bigger complexity than others, but we're not talking about complexity here. We don't care. We can use as many registers as we want. So initially, the perspective that something like this would be impossible is weird. But what Maurice did, which I think was really fantastic, is that he was, I think, maybe just left MIT, but he still had the MIT culture in his mind. And part of this culture was a result that was proven few years before 90, completely different. And that result says there is this problem called consensus, very abstract. And some people have shown that that problem is impossible. And I'm going to show you the problem of consensus. And some people have shown that that problem was impossible. And what Maurice did was to say, oh, but maybe there is a link between fetch and increment. And this, which is a very concrete problem, counters are, you made them all the time. And this abstract problem called consensus. And what he did is bridge the gap between the two. So follow me. What he has shown is if you have a fetch and increment, you can solve consensus. Given that consensus is impossible, therefore, fetch and increment is impossible. He didn't do that only for fetch and increment. He did that for many objects that we believe are practical, like a queue. For example, a queue is very useful. Whenever you have a producer-consumer problem, you need a queue. Again, he's shown that once you have a queue, you can build a consensus. I will show you what consensus is. But consensus is impossible. It has been shown by others. Therefore, a queue is impossible. Fetch and climate is impossible, etc. Okay? So what is this famous consensus? Okay, the consensus problem was defined in a slightly different context, but it can easily be rephrased in, the, in our context today. We can represent it as an object. So it's an object, very simple. It has one operation propose, and processes use it by proposing a value. Okay? So just like writing a value, here you propose a value. And the property is you propose a value to it, and as a return, either you get the value you propose or you get a different value. The guarantee is that everybody gets the same value. So it's like saying we want to go to the movies tonight. We don't want to start uh, fighting a movie we want to see. We use the consensus object. Each of us propose the movie we want to see to this consensus object. And the goal of the consensus object is to return one of these values. Okay, the consensus object is not allowed to give us a value that nobody has proposed. Okay, it has to give one of us. Okay, so it's very simple. And... 
more is here. He has shown the following result. Consensus can be implemented among two processes with fetch and increment and registers. What does that mean? We can use fetch and increment together with registers to build this consensus object, which will allow us to go to the movies together for two processes. Can you think of an algorithm? It's very simple. Of an algorithm that allows us to solve consensus using fetch and increment and registers. By the way, only two processes. Only two processes want to go to the movies. So they want to solve consensus, meaning each of them can propose a value and we have to decide on one. How do you do that using fetch and increment and registers? Just see any idea. So I have fetch and increment, this famous counter, and we want to agree on something. How do we do that? 